and bonjour. Greetings. My name is Janet Rogers. I'm your host with 13 Moons, 13 Reads. I'm Mohawk Tuscarora, and I'm a writer myself and a new publisher with the Ojisto Publishing Label coming to you from Six Nations of the Grand River Territory. This month, we are celebrating the Mawad, Gizits, or the Migrating Moon, here to tell us more about the importance of the Mawad, uh, Gizits, is Anishinaabe educator Debbie Beach to Charm. Debbie is a member of Lake Manitoba First Nations, also known as Dog Creek in Treaty 2 territory. Take it away, Debbie. The 10th moon of the calendar uh, is the migra migrating moon. Bimam Moak Jesus. And Imam Wat, Imam Wat Jesus is um, the migrating moon where the weather starts to cool and the winged ones start to migrate south for the winter. So you'll see a lot of activity happening in the, in the forest, in the skies. Uh, the weather's now changing. The winds are starting to change as well. So this is why this month is called the Migrating Moon, Miigwech. Miigwech Nyawe, Debbie, for sharing your knowledge of Bemam, uh, sorry, Bemam Moed uh, Gizits. Am I saying that right, actually? I'd have to see how it's spelled. Oh, okay. Yeah. Bema, Bema Mawad, uh, Gizits. Our special guest this month is Wab Kanu. So wel welcome, Wab. I'm going to just let the um, uh, viewers uh, know a little bit about yourself here. Wab is an Anishinaabe, born in Kenora, Ontario, and grew up in Treaty 3 territory. Wab has had many careers in his life, starting out as a rapper with two albums, Live by the Drum, which I used to play a lot of when I was doing radio in Victoria, BC. Um, yeah, uh, Coast Salish territory. And Midday Sun, and Wab has published two books previous titled The Reason You Walk, a nonfiction memoir, and Go Show the World a Celebration of Indigenous Heroes. That's a children's book. And the book we're focused on today is Wab's third. It's a YA fantasy fiction novel titled Walking Into Worlds. Such a beautiful cover and such a beautiful thick volume of a story here. Um, he had a well-celebrated career as a journalist and a broadcaster with CBC and hosted a documentary series called Eighth Fire and currently represents the NDP party as an MLA of Manitoba. And I think you were also an educator, WAP. So please fill us in on anything I may have missed along the way there. Oh, you did a great job. And okay. <laughs> I don't uh, need to talk about myself any more than that. But okay. I did want to say that Debbie, who we heard from there, is my mother in law. Yes. And uh, congratulations on your new book. It's uh, this is a very exciting. Thank you. Yeah. And I think, you know, the first question, and it's probably like an obvious question, you know, why have you, Wab, written this particular book? I think that that is answered in the dedication. And I wouldn't mind if you could share with us the, de the dedication and the story yeah. behind that, please. Yeah, I, I mean, it's pretty short, so I could actually just read the dedication. Um, so yeah, right at the start, before we get into the story, it says, to the students at Pelican Falls First Nations High School. Visiting your school over the years, I've noticed you face many things going to school away from home, some good and some bad, but you face them all with courage. I started this book thinking it might be cool if you could read something that represented our backgrounds and some of the realities you face. Anobuachigik, seek your dreams. So the story behind uh, Pelican, as they call it, is that this is a high school for First Nations kids from northern communities, fly-in communities in northern Ontario. And so these are communities that don't have high schools uh, in their own backyards. And so the kids have to move away and live in residence at this school just outside of Sioux Lookout, Ontario. And so I've been lucky to visit there a few times. And one of the things that really struck me is the resilience of the kids and like their good nature and the fact, like as I alluded to there, they're, they're young people sorting out who they are for the first time in their lives. They're away from home. They're pursuing their their dreams, they're trying to advance their lives. And then they have all the normal challenges of that, 
but they're also in this very unique situation of um, living at that uh, residence and living at school. And um, I should add that this school today is built on the site of a former residential school. So there was a Pelican uh, Falls residential school in the past, and there's a monument to that there today. And so the, the past is very much, I guess, present for the young people there. And at the same time, when I was visiting them, I noticed that a lot of young people were reading books, like YA fantasy novels, stuff like Harry Potter they were reading. And so I just started thinking like, you know, it, it, it's so cool that, they, that they're reading fiction and they're, they're, they're checking out books, but uh, it'd be great if we could introduce uh, some more Anishinaabe and Indigenous, you know, maybe concepts into that same genre and maybe give them something that's entertaining and exciting for them, but also is also maybe a little uh, relatable. And so that's where the idea came from. It's not really what the book is about, but it's just like that was the jumping off point. And then I started thinking about, OK, like what's going on in the world today? Technology, culture, identity, all these different things swirling around and started the creative process. But I do want to add that I did send some copies of the book to the school uh, because of COVID. They're doing remote learning right now. So I haven't been able to visit the school with the book yet, but I hope to do so. And uh, the principal, you know, sent the note back and, and just made a good point, which is like, you know, they're, they're like, thanks for acknowledging us. And I hope you can share with the rest of the country, uh, just to remind people that our students, meaning the, the Pelican students uh, from Northern Ontario, they have to overcome these tremendous barriers to pursue their educations, travel, living away from home, all those challenges. Um, that many of uh, the other pe people in, in this country take for granted. And so I really appreciated that because as much as I'm going to have a chance to talk about this book and travel around, hopefully we can also uh, shine a light and remind people about the, the work we still have to do to make sure every child can get that uh, education and reach their full potential that they deserve. Yeah, that's wonderful. The, the students must be thrilled to have a dedication of a whole book to them. Yeah, well, like I said, I haven't had a chance to see them face to face because of COVID, uh, but I hope so. And uh, yeah, what I've heard back from, you know, people there and the people who work there is uh, it, it's been positive so far. Yeah. And I think people were excited and they even sent me a hoodie with the uh, school logo. <laughs> so that's pretty cool. That is cool. Um, the two worlds you're referencing is, you know, the colonial world and the indigenous world. And, but that is not necessarily the case with this story. So if you could just fill us in what two worlds you're referencing in the book, please, Bob. Well, it, there's like a bunch of different ways to take it. Um, so the book itself is about this character on the front, Bugs, which is short for her, her Anishinaabe name, Buganegizhigok. But Bugs is pretty typical, like somewhat shy young person growing up on the res, maybe a little reserved, but then in the online world of gaming and social media, they're a superstar. They're like the most popular, most successful gamer in the world. And they play this game that's kind of like Fortnite meets Minecraft uh, type of thing. So we've all heard, and I'm sure you've heard many times, the idea of walking in two worlds, right? Like we have the indigenous world where we want to take our pride and identity and culture from and then there's the mainstream world where we're going to go and pursue education or career or whatever um, sort of success we imagine for ourselves in that world and we always hear about we need to walk in two worlds walk in two worlds but then when I started thinking about the young people at that high school the young people that I know even my own kids I started to think well there's another way to think about two worlds today which is like the world of the virtual the online, the social media, the gaming, and then there's the real world. And the thing that I noticed is that for a lot of young people, the virtual world is at least as important as the real world. And that was one of the themes that I was really thinking a lot about while I was writing the book. And then the pandemic happened. And then it became even more pronounced, even more magnified, even more amplified that effect, because all of a sudden, like using my children as an example, uh, who are uh, the two oldest of whom are teenagers, all of a sudden when COVID and lockdowns and remote learning and stuff happened, 
their only way to talk to their friends was on Xbox Live or using their phones, you know, different apps, social media, things like that. And so this idea of us walking in two worlds, whether or not we're the biggest gamers, we probably can relate to the idea of there's our self that we project on Facebook and Instagram and YouTube and TikTok and uh, any other platform like that. And then there's who we are in the real world. And then even taking it another step further than that, there's like our inner and outer life too. There's like how we relate to other people and our personality as we're perceived by others. And then there's the, the voice inside our head and how we think about ourselves and sometimes the doubts and insecurities or like the dreams and aspirations that we have for ourselves. So to me, it's, it's sort of like that same idea of walking in two worlds that we learned from the indigenous perspective, but then now carrying that over into technology and identity and mental health and all these different aspects. And hopefully maybe not providing answers for all those different things, but just exploring it in a way that, you know, young people will be able to take something out of and. You know, human beings being so adaptable, like we're, I mean, if, 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 if the past two years have proven anything to us as human beings that, you know, we are adaptable yep. and the, and the idea that, we are embracing, as Indigenous people, we're embracing these digital worlds and practices and, uh, and the colonial worlds that are outside of us or that we're embracing as well in order to achieve the things that we want to in our lives. I am wondering, Wab, if there, do you think that there is room for the spiritual world that is so much at the foundation of what Indigenous culture is? And if you have written that in to the story, and if, if you have, how does that play out? Yeah, I think there is room for it. And, you know, because the cultures have always been adapting, you know, whether it's how beadwork has evolved over the years, or whether it's how artwork has evolved over the years, or transportation, and now even like native meme culture, if you know, we, uh, we think about like Pepsi and aunties and uncles and all this like new meanings that have been um, uh, created and, uh, you know, uh, have evolved over the past number of years like definitely I, I know that culture is always evolving and adapting and it's a sign of the resilience of people the resilience of indigenous peoples in, in this context in particular and I think that like because the spirituality is such a strong part of Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee and other indigenous ways of, of being and knowing I know that the spirituality will always be brought into whatever we do including in the technological world and so how I related it in this book is that, you know, in Black Panther, the yeah. Marvel movie, where they have Wakanda, and it's yeah. like a vision of an Afro-futurist world where they've kind of recreated and reinvented an advanced civilization and advanced economy built on um, some cultures from Africa, you know, in this book, this young woman, because she's in this virtual world that's sort of like a, it's got the creativity of a Minecraft where the, the, the players can sort of build things up. What she's done is she's built like the Anishinaabe legends, like all oh, the creatures from the supernatural world of the Anishinaabe. She's built those things into the online world. And so you have these, um, you know, I hesitate to use the word like mythological because there's kind of a, a negative connotation to it but like the legendary creatures that our elders talked about are now there in the 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 virtual world the online gaming world and she is connected to her surroundings in a way that calls to mind like a lot of the cultural ideas about respecting the earth and the water and your surroundings and so she's very much not somebody who's trying to discover her culture or learn about her culture she's somebody who's empowered and raised by her culture and now she's showing everybody around the world from all walks of life all different backgrounds what somebody could be um, when they come from that way of life at the deeper level the spirituality that's formed by the indigenous culture that she's from i think is sort of like her guiding light and what allows her to keep um keep moving forward and I think that's what it's like for a lot of people, you know, if we could jump back into like the real life conversation here, 
on a given day, we might be posting something on social media or playing some games online or having a conversation through some app. And uh, maybe that's all very much a technological thing, but hopefully the way we're doing it, the way we're carrying ourselves, it's still true to the spiritual dimension of our lives as Anishinaabe or Haudenosaunee or Métis or Cree or what have you. Uh, it's still true to our spiritual lives as Indigenous peoples. Yeah, that's a, that's a really, really good point. You know, we, and we're of an age, I, if I may say that, we're of an age where we saw this kind of uh, new reality, new uh kind of uh, consistent, the way that it's so consistently in our lives, the digital worlds that, and we saw it come into being that, you know, I, I for me anyway, at the beginning, I was kind of like, yeah, but that's not real. Like that, all that world, that's not real, is it? But then you kind of have to realize, well, it kind of is real because it does affect a lot of things that happen uh, outside of, outside in, in, you know, quote unquote, real life. Um, so correct me if I'm wrong, you have three sons, yeah, that's right. Three sons. And, and, and your protagonist is a young female. So I'm wondering if you, you know, I, I'm pretty sure like your wife is outnumbered at home, uh, you know, four to one. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so I'm wondering if you had any assistance with getting the voice Definitely. of the, female, the young female character and who, who, who was that and what, how did that consultation go? What did you learn? Well, Lisa, for sure. That's my wife. Uh, she's a uh, big help. Um, and um my sister Shawan. So uh, I actually have, um, you know, um, five sisters. Uh, but um, Shawan is, I guess, the one in the family who's next youngest after me. And uh, we're very close. And I just, and then I also turned to a lot of advanced readers. So I had some really good people to like, review early copies uh, of the book. And you know, I don't want to list them all because I don't want to uh, leave anybody out. But um, basically, they were very helpful. And I guess the other thing that I did is I just tried to take the character seriously, you know, and I just tried to ask, like, whoa, how would I feel if that happened to me? Or how would I respond? And just like, with the full complexity and range of emotions that I think I would feel or that I could imagine another person that I know reacting to a similar situation, that I just tried to invest that into into the character. And so, yeah. That's uh, basically how uh, how that all came about. Well done, congratulations on that. Um, because yeah, because your the the story is so um, focused on it, the digital world. I I, I I like to think of you know the airwaves. You know, you certainly were working in broadcasting, and I like to you know I really love working in radio, and I think of those um, uh, technologies as being territories. And, you know, like right. any other territory, Indigenous people need to claim our space in those territories. And also, and at the same time, realizing that, you know, uh, people who are other than ourselves have created those digital spaces. And so because of that, there's possibly, no, I'm not going to say possibly, I'm going to say there are, there are cultural biases within the digital realms. And if you have um, noted that in the in the story, and if you have talked about any cultural bias, how do you co counter that in the story? Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And I do very much see what you're talking about in terms of Indigenous uh, people taking space and reclaiming space in the online world. And, you know, I think some of the really good examples are like the influencers that we see on social media who are very popular, either like doing like powwow dance and explaining that to their audiences or just presenting a certain image. And then also a lot of the content creators, whether that's in um, like radio, podcast, TV, video, you know, reservation dogs being a, a big, big example of that recently. Um, so I definitely think that's, that's, that's legit. And then like the, the other side of the coin, as you're saying, um, how people can encounter static or even discrimination in those worlds, I think is very real. <clears throat> and the way it manifested in the book is, so there's, you know, in, in gaming, there are clans, meaning like groups of gamers who, um, you know, play with one another and they're kind of like teammates and they go through their, the virtual world with one another. And I thought that that's interesting because like uh, Anishinaabe people have clans too, like traditional clans, right, that we're related to. And so for her, uh, meaning Bugs, the protagonist of the book, 
one of the like big enemies that she has to confront in the story and in the online world is this rival clan. And I kind of modeled some of it after what we've been seeing, unfortunately, with like the alt-right the past few years. And also what happened with uh, something called Gamergate, where a lot of uh, young women gamers were being targeted with a, a lot of really sexist comments and negativity online. And so I just took that idea of like, you know, some some people with really toxic behaviors online trying to, you know, um, bully or intimidate or chase her out of there. But the thing is, in the book, she's such a talent. She's such a unique creative mind who's so adept at this online world that she's able to push those folks back and she's still able in your words to claim that space for herself and even though she is encountering these very stressful forms of uh you know um messages and spam and different kind of you know communication directed at her she's still able to stand strong and stand proud uh, uh, of who she is and so to me, that's one of the things that I wanted to, I guess, explore in the book, because every time a technology comes out, it's always like the utopian view that we're presented. We're always told this is going to change the world. It's going to be for the best. Everything's going to be perfect. And then when we actually get it, things go sideways, things become challenging. And so like, let's look at Facebook, for example. I think Facebook has opened up a lot of communication in First Nations communities and Indigenous communities. It's allowed people to be connected in a way that they haven't before, including in, in many remote communities. Facebook Messenger has allowed people to stay in touch. But then at the same time, there's a lot of negativity on Facebook, right? In many, many ways. And that's not unique to the Indigenous community. That's across the whole platform. We see that playing out with like the misinformation around the pandemic or politics or all sorts of different things. And so the thing that I wanted to get across in the book, among many other ideas, is like, it's not necessarily the technology itself. It's how we use it. So are we going to use it in a positive way? Or are we going to let the negativity take over? And for me, I really hope that it's the positivity because, you know, when I was young, I remember being part of that Nintendo generation and we were told like, yeah, Nintendo, it's going to, you know, rot your brain. But I think we turned out okay in spite of the fact we played Nintendo. And so when I look at this younger generation with smartphones and with TikTok and with like the, the gaming Xbox Live PS5 world, um, been, you know, at their fingertips, I think, you know what, there, there are negative aspects to what they're exposed to but i think as long as we help them and we equip them with the tools that they need to be successful i think they're going to turn out all right as well and they're going to turn out better than all right in fact they're going to turn out to be a very good people but again it's not going to happen by accident we have to work with young people we have to talk to them we have to ensure that the cultural supports and the, the language are, are, are present for them so that if they do encounter some of that static or some of those bumps in the road, that they do have that uh, resilience and that ability to bounce back and to overcome. Yeah, wow, it is, it, I mean, if, if anything, uh, te the technology has proven to us just what babies we are in, 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 in interacting with it and learn, it's teaching us how uh, how best to use it and use it for good. You know, it is a superpower uh, as you've kind of written it. Yeah, like we're still cool. learning it, right? Yeah, totally. Like babies in the sense of like, we're we're just at the very beginning and like yeah. really, yeah, yeah. No, I take yeah. that. Yeah. It's really, so it's, it's really, it's really great. And I know like, you know, even when I'm mentoring some uh, young poets, they cannot write a poem without including technology in it. Like I woke up and texted my girlfriend and you know, like they, they go on like this and I'm like, whoa, like, you know, even 10 years ago, we wouldn't have heard poetry like that. So it's, it's really, it's really, it's here to stay, man. And so I'm glad that you've, um, you brought it into, you know, a good a fictional context, which is really good. Yeah. And I think like, that's, that's how it's going to be. Like when I go to, no matter what context, including like a traditional ceremony, people have their smartphones there, right? Yeah. Um, people are recording uh, ceremony songs on their phone so that they can learn them later and then participate in the ceremony in a very sacred way. That's and that's not going to go away. So wonderful. Have you chosen a, a piece to share with us from the book there, Wab? I thought I like, uh, I thought I'd just read the first paragraph, basically, just the yeah. start of the book, because I think it just kind of, 
actually it captures a lot of what you and I have just been discussing. Okay. Yeah. So this is right away chapter one. It was the best of bugs. It was the worst of bugs. She created life. She destroyed worlds. She appeared invincible. She knew only defeat. She was indigenous. She didn't belong. She moved with absolute confidence. She couldn't shake the tiny voice inside. It's no big deal. It's the end of the world. In many ways, Bugs was just like everybody else until she went online into the Floriverse. There, Bugs' every move was watched by the entire world who either loved her or hated her. So yeah, so the Floriverse, that's the virtual world of like this online universe that uh, she's created. And uh, she has all those you know, influences from Anishinaabe culture, but she's also playing with uh, gamers from around the world. So yeah, so it just kind of introduces like the two, the two world thing and all the different dichotomies and, you know, uh, tensions uh, for the character there right at the start. That's wonderful. It really sounds like oratory, you know, like (laughs) this this speech about this person, it makes me want to lean in and learn more about the story. So yeah, right on. great. That's a great opening paragraph. Um, And that concludes our chat, our author chat. It's been great. It's been great getting to know about this book. And I wish you all kinds of success with it. We're going to thank you, Wob, uh, for speaking with us today. And also thanks to Debbie Beach Ducharme, your mother-in-law, uh, for right. her insights into the migrating moon this month. You can get uh, Walking Into Worlds uh, along with Wob's other two books, uh, Go Show the World and The Reason You Walk, um, uh, by going to www.goodminds.com and ordering them. Remember to use the promo code 13 moons 13 reads and you're going to get 10 bucks off your order. And if you'd like to win a copy of Walking Into Worlds, please like and subscribe to goodminds.com YouTube channel, comment on this video, and you will be entered for a chance to win a copy of WAP's newest book. Next month is the Gash Gidini Gizits, which is the frost moon. Oh my God, already. Uh, Stay tuned for that. Remember to get all of your Indigenous books at goodminds.com. They are a family-run business, Indigenous-owned, independent book distributor. So make sure that you go and visit them and lend your support. Nyawa Goa uh, for tuning in. And thanks, everyone. Take care until we see you next time in the next moon. Thank you again, Wab Kanu. Nyawa, miigwech.